In this video, we're going to do a brief overview of the pathophysiology of COPD. In order to lead this into the pre-hospital treatments or those frontline treatments that we should be administering to patients who are having an exacerbation of their COPD. So we're going to use smoking as the trigger here because uh, in our context, typically smoking is going to be the leading cause of COPD, um, although not the only cause of COPD. We'll use that as our uh, trigger to kind of guide our uh, pathophysiology discussion here. So when we start off looking at COPD, typically we're looking at someone who has uh, an extensive smoking history. Uh, often a 20 pack year habit is associated with the development of COPD or someone who has smoked about a pack a day for 20 years or somewhere that uh, something that falls into that calculation would be two packs a day for 10 years, uh, basically getting us to that 20 pack year history. So smoking is the primary cause, and the reason for smoking being the primary cause is the stress that it puts on the lung parenchymal tissue um, and basically the cells of the lungs. When we're looking at COPD, we're going to talk both about emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and we're not going to talk about them separately. We're going to look at them as comorbid pathologies that are happening at once in someone's lungs based on the effects of smoking on the lung tissues. So the issue with smoking is that it causes oxidative stress. So when someone smokes, um, we're going to see an increase in oxidative stress within the lungs. And this is going to have a primary impact on our respiratory bronchioles. So that's what I've drawn in here. These are the bronchioles just before the alveoli. So our respiratory bronchial and our alveoli are going to be the most uh, negatively affected by smoking and the oxidative stress that occurs. This oxidative stress is going to lead to the production of free radicals. So we see an increase in free radical production as a result of uh, the oxidative stress that's occurring. And those free radicals are going to start to damage the tissue of the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. So I'm drawing in these free radicals here, and these free radicals do direct damage to the tissues of the alveoli and the bronchioles. So we see an increase in free radical production, and these free radicals are going to uh, damage the lung tissue. So we start to see uh, damage to the lung tissue. And what we know is when we have this type of damage, we're going to see an inflammatory response. So no different than a physical injury, when we have uh, damage to tissues, that's going to lead to an in, uh, inflammatory response. So that damage to the lung tissue is going to lead to an inflammatory response. And in this case, the big issue with the inflammatory response is going to be the recruitment of neutrophils. So COPD is primarily related to neutrophil uh, recruitment within the alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles. So we get an inflammatory response, um, again, which is going to be primarily related to an increase in neutrophil infiltration. So as we have uh, basically damage, so we start to see that lung tissue damage, that's going to activate our inflammatory response. So we start to see inflammation being activated. And as we have inflammation, one of the responses is going to be the production of neutrophils. So we start to see an increase in neutrophil levels within the body as we have this damage to the lung tissues. Now what's interesting about smoking is that the nicotine within cigarette smoke actually leads to a chemotaxic effect. So uh, nicotine actually promotes the infiltration of neutrophils to the lungs itself, or they um, act as a signal to say, pull those neutrophils into the lungs, here is where the damage is. Uh, so when we have smoking, nicotine leads to a chemotaxic effect, or that nicotine is actually an attractant to neutrophils. So we see chemotaxis, which means that not only do we have an increase in neutrophil production, we start to see more neutrophils making their way into the lungs uh, because of that chemotaxis. So lots of neutrophil production, neutrophils will start to infiltrate the lungs, uh, but that chemotaxic effect really increases uh, the number of neutrophils that are making their way up into the uh, lung tissue. So again, we're looking primarily here at the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. So we start to see infiltration of neutrophils into the area, which are going to cause damages and remodeling that will actually lead to uh, COPD. So we're going to take a look at the emphysema arm first. So what is happening in emphysema? And emphysema is primarily related to an increased production of elastase, which is an enzyme that breaks down elastin. So when we look at the emphysema arm of COPD, this increase in neutrophil infiltra infiltration actually leads to an increase in uh, elastase production, or the enzyme that is going to break down elastin. We'll draw in our elastase in pink here. So as we have an increase in neutrophils, we have an increase in elastase, which is an enzyme that is going to break down elastin. And so we see targeted destruction of elastin as a result of this uh, infiltration of elastase. And we have elastin living in both our alveoli and our respiratory bronchial. So we have elastase comes in and is going to break down elast elastase comes in and is going to break down elastin. We see here the breakdown of elastin as a result of this elastase. And that causes two primary problems for these patients. 
One is that elastin lives between our bronchioles and provides bronchial tethering. So it actually kind of looks like a little spring between our bronchioles, which is which are going to help pull the bronchioles open. So they act to pull the bronchioles open, especially during times of increased pressure. Uh, so if our intrathoracic pressure is going up or we are expiring and our pressure is going up within the chest wall, uh, the bronchial tethering of elastin is pulling those bronchioles open. We're losing that bronchial tethering. Um, as we have a uh, breakdown of elastin. So one of the big problems is we get uh, loss of bronchial tethering, which will lead to bronchial collapse, where the bronchi are, are not able, or the respiratory bronchioles are not able to stay open as well. So we get bronchial collapse. This is especially true during expiration. So as intrathoracic pressure goes up, our bronchioles become prone to collapse, and this is gonna reduce our lumen size. So I just wanna draw on the fact here that we have this increased pressure or inability to uh, resist the pressure that is occurring or the increased pressure that can occur in the intrathoracic space which is going to push all of these uh, tissues of the bronchioles in, which will obviously lead to a reduction in lumen size. So uh, just the fact that we lose the tethering of our bronchioles is going to lead to a reduction in uh, lumen size. The other issue with a breakdown of elastin is that elastin is what gives our alveoli their recoil ability. So picture an elastic band when we stretch it out, what allows it to recoil back into shape is the amount of elastin that we have in the tissue. So when we have a breakdown of elastin in the alveoli, we lose our uh, alveolar recoil. And essentially the alveoli become flimsy and can become hyperinflated. So they'll take in a lot of air, um, but they won't be able to get a lot of air out because they've lost that recoil. So picture a balloon that you inflate. Uh, as soon as you uh, open basically the exit to that balloon, the recoil of that balloon allows air to exit, well, we lose that ability. Picture a balloon that's been inflated too many times and a lot of air just kind of stays in it. Or picture yourself pinching the exit to the balloon that's what this kind of loss of bronchial tethering and bronchial collapse causes. So we start to see alveoli that will accept a lot of air and they'll kind of become hyperinflated. Um, and we can't get that air out because the bronchioles are collapsing uh, during expiration. So one of the issues that are, is going to happen here is we lose alveolar recoil, which leads to alveolar hyperinflation. And together, those pieces are going to lead to air trapping, which is most common in emphysema um, and can be really challenging for the COPD patient. The other thing that we have to consider when we have something like an increase in neutrophil infiltration is the production of chronic bronchitis. And chronic bronchitis is basically just a chronic cough in a patient who has a COPD, which is related to an increase in mucus production and the inability to expel that mucus or expel it very well. And the reason for that is the exact same. So we have this response happening, smoking, oxidative stress, damage to lung tissue, an increase in neutrophil infiltration. And what it leads to is an increased size and number of our goblet cells and the mucus secreting apparatus. So the goblet cell is the cell here that's making mucus. The mucus secreting apparatus is basically the pump that's pushing mucus out into the alveoli. So what we start to see is an increased size and number of goblet cells and mucus secreting apparatus. And if you think about the problem with that, so um, again, we're going to see an increased size and number of our goblet cells and our mucus secreting apparatus. So these are the cells that are producing mucus, mucus secreting apparatus. We're going to see more of them being formed to create mucus and push mucus out into the uh, alveoli and the bronchioles. And what we start to see is more mucus in the alveoli, more mucus in the bronchioles. And again, if you think about the consequence of this, it's going to be a further reduction in lumen size. So we already have a smaller lumen, and now when we start adding mucus to the mix, the lumen is even smaller. So that's going to be a constant trend here is that we have a small lumen, which makes it hard to get air in and out. The other issue that we're going to see associated with chronic bronchitis and neutrophil infiltration is we start to see an increase in our vascular permeability, and we start to see vasodilation. And this will cause swelling. Specifically, in these cases, we see swelling of the basement membrane. And that swelling, again, is going to further lead to a reduction in lumen size. So that swelling is typically happening in this area. So our vascular is becoming more permeable, um, and that's going to lead to edema. And that's going to push in on our lumen and, again, have a further reduction in lumen size. So often these patients have bronchial collapse, which is leading to um, difficulty getting air in and out, plus a fairly dramatic reduction in lumen size. Again, when we started our lumen, uh, the walls of our lumen were here, and now we're looking at a patient whose lumen is only about this. The area for gas exchange, the ability to get gas in has been reduced, uh, as well as restricted in terms of getting as, uh, gas out. Patients often also have a challenge uh, getting mucus out of the lungs because smoking will paralyze uh, cilia and the damage to the lung tissue will actually lead to replacement of the cells that create cilia um, with other cells. So we, uh, in two, for two reasons, we see loss of basically loss of cilia and loss of function of cilia. And the problem with this is that cilia uh, play an important role in sweeping mucus out from the lower parts of the lungs to the upper part of the airway so we can cough it out. So this patient is stuck trying to cough this mucus out uh, from really low in their lungs, which can be very challenging.
So with those things in mind, we can take a look at the treatment of patients experiencing exacerbation of COPD. One of the leading causes of exacerbation of COPD is exercise. Um, so the patient exerts themselves and their COPD will be exacerbated. If you think about the reason for that, um, again, we have a pretty significant BQ's mismatch here uh, and very little room for compensation uh, when the patient's exerting themselves. So exertion can lead to worsening of the condition and uh, can lead to exacerbation. One of the other causes is infection. So as this patient has lots of mucus and they can't get the mucus out because of the cilia, um, it does increase the situation where they're prone to pathogen colonization, which can lead to um, basically worsening of symptoms because it leads to an even more inflammatory response. When we look at treatment, we basically are going to look at our frontline treatment, our second line treatment, and then kind of a third line treatment for COPD patients. Um, and sometimes we get the order mixed up. And the order is important because the evidence tells us that patients who have COPD will often respond very well to minimal treatments, regardless of presenting severity. So um, mild to severe COPD often responds well to these frontline treatments. And the first one is a uh, is low concentration oxygen. So uh, typically we're looking at low concentration oxygen for these patients. Um, and what I mean by low concentration oxygen is usually we're uh, increasing the amount of oxygen that they are on by about two liters per minute. So we're looking at two liters per minute increases above normal for these patients. And that has been shown to have a really positive effect on exacerbation. So we don't need to be putting high concentration oxygen on these patients to have a good effect. Usually the COPD patient is going to respond very well to low uh, concentration increases in oxygenation. So if they're on no oxygen, we'll start at two liters per minute, typically titrating up at two liters per minute every two to five minutes, depending on oxygen saturation. Um, and again, often that is going to work really well for the patient. If they are on home oxygen, say they're on four liters per minute, we're going to bump that up by two liters per minute in order to uh, have effect. What's important to note here is that our target is between 88 and 92%. So we're looking at 88 to 92%. And the reason for that is that if we overshoot that, so if we end up titrating this patient's oxygen to anything over 92%, the risk is increased free radical production. And if we increase free radical production, we know that uh, one of the consequences of that uh, is going to be uh, neutrophil inf infiltration. So we want to target that 88 to 92% because we do not want to impact our free radical production. So over supersaturation or oversaturation of this patient can lead to free radical production and can actually make COPD worse. They found that targeting those higher levels of oxygen can uh, be worse for those patients. We start low um, and titrate up as necessary for these patients. So long, low concentration oxygen paired with a bronchodilator. Um, so again, we're looking at something like Ventolin here is beneficial to these uh, patients because it actually is going to target the underlying problem. So the reason why we want to start with our bronchodilator is that we know one of the primary problems for this patient or really the primary problems for this patient is going to be the reduction in lumen size. So that bronchodilator is actually going to increase lumen size and will target all of these problems. Bronchial collapse will target the swelling of the basement membrane, which is reducing lumen size, as well as the mucus production, which is going to reduce uh, lumen size. So the bronchodilator is beneficial to these patients because it actually targets uh, the core underlying cause of most COPD exacerbation, which can be bronchoconstriction, which will also um, impact the reduction in lumen size that they have already. So when we're looking at first line treatment for these patients, we really should be thinking low concentration oxygen and a bronchodilator. We should only pair CPAP if necessary for these patients. CPAP can be anxiety inducing for patients. Uh, CPAP can increase intrathoracic pressure. So there are some kind of consequences to CPAP that we would like to avoid if possible. Um, so only if the patient does not improve with low concentration oxygen increases or bronchodilator administration. So we try our uh, oxygen, we'll try our first round of our bronchodilator. If the patient isn't improving with that treatment, that's when we move to CPAP. And CPAP is an adjunct to bronchodilator treatment because it really only targets that bronchial collapse that we see uh, with the emphysema arm of the pathology. So when we look at what is CPAP doing, CPAP targets this alone. So CPAP doesn't really do anything for mucus production, reduction of lumen size. The big kind of benefit of CPAP is that it's going to provide that positive pressure, which will help stent open these bronchioles. So we know we've lost the ability to stent these bronchioles open or we've lost the bronchial tethering that's helping them stay open under times of high pressure. So putting CPAP on the patient is going to help promote uh, kind of pushing those bronchioles open and preventing collapse uh, in times of high pressure. So we're going to start with our low concentration of bronchodilator. Again, the evidence tells us that patients typically respond very well. So regardless of presenting severity, patients respond very well to low concentration of bronchodilator administration when they're having a COPD exacerbation. If our first round of treatment of these don't work, that's when we consider pairing 
CPAP as an adjunct to these two things. So CPAP is an adjunct to bronchodilator administration uh, for the patient in order to help promote fill stenting and increasing lumen size. The other thing that we want to consider for these patients is a steroid. So in this case, we're going to talk about dexamethasone. And dexamethasone is beneficial to these patients for uh, more long-term outcomes. And de dexamethasone is going to be a neutrophil suppressant. So uh, dexamethasone is actually going to work to suppress neutrophils. It does this over an extended period of time. Uh, so we typically don't see onset until about four hours after administration. And we're looking at 24 to 48 hours for full action. But the benefit to dexamethasone is it reduces major adverse events associated with COPD. So when we give dexamethasone in the pre-hospital setting, some of the things that we start to see is a decrease in hospitalization, decrease in intubation, decreased hospital stays, so the amount of uh, time the patient is admitted. We also see a decrease in pharmacological treatment, and future exacerbations are typically less severe. So although dexamethasone doesn't typically have an immediate effect for the patient when we're looking at pre-hospital setting, these benefits occur later on. And this is the reason why, say the patient does resolve with low concentration, increase in oxygen, and the administration of bronchodilator, we would still give dexamethasone to that patient for the long-term benefits. We're trying to target those neutrophils and decrease these things from happening for that patient or having um, as much severity of these things happening for this patient. So that's one of the benefits. So again, just to recap, we want to start with low concentration, uh, low concentrations of oxygen. One, because the evidence tells us that patients respond really well when we titrate two liters per minute above normal. And we're targeting that 88 to 92% because we don't want to increase free radical production with over oxygenation. We then would move to our bronchodilator, so something like salbutamol, in order to promote bronchodilation, which will increase lumen size. And we know that reduction in lumen size is the core problem here because of uh, all of the aspects related to COPD. We've got bronchial collapse, mucus production, and swelling. Well, when I give a bronchodilator, it increases the lumen size combating those things for this patient. So we should get more area for gas exchange, allowing for a better VQ uh, for this patient. If that doesn't work, we move on to CPAP. And CPAP is an adjunct um, because it is going to target this. The loss of bronchial tethering doesn't do much for the other areas, but is a secondary treatment to help promote getting some of that bronchodilator in and making breathing more easy as we uh, don't have as much uh, bronchial collapse during expiration. At some point during this call, we want to administer dexamethasone to this patient. And again, the dexamethasone is beneficial because it targets the neutrophil aspect of this pathology, which is really the driving force behind all of the remodeling that occurs in COPD.